I, I shall try to channel Matt Beard. Um, good morning. I'd like to begin my offering by paying my respects remotely to the Naganawal people on whose traditional land this conference is taking place and to their elders past and present. I'd also like to offer you all my sincere apologies for not being able to be present at the conference in person. I'm disappointed not to be able to exchange ideas with you over the course of the conference, and I hope this paper might provide some stimulus for you all. I also like to acknowledge the content of this paper emerges from a piece of work I completed for the Army Research Scheme, along with co-authors Jay Galat and Sandy Lynch. Introduction. There are myriad opportunities presented by biomedical human enhancement of military forces, and recognition of this has prompted substantial research and limited implementation of some forms of medical enhancement by various military organizations. These include ethical advantages where enhancement might reduce unethical conduct during war. However, with, as with most emerging technologies, it would be reckless to pursue these opportunities without first identifying the ethical risks such interventions may pose. Not only can, they, can these undermine the ethical advantages of enhancement, but they may lead to reputational crises which stymie further research and development. Here I outline a few of the not insurmountable risks posed by enhancement and suggest some avenues of safeguarding against them. I don't intend for this presentation to propose anything radically new in terms of theory. What I do hope it will do is map the ethical terrain a little bit without fortifying itself into a particular moral position. I accept that the benefits, both pragmatic and ethical, of enhancement are hard to ignore, but I hope that this discussion might help further development be undertaken in a spirit of ethical restraint, mindful of potential collateral damage and unintended side effects. What is enhancement? For, this, for the sake of this discussion, I'm going to accept the definition of enhancement provided by Eric Jungst. I quote, a medical or biological intervention to the body designed to improve performance, appearance, or capability besides what is necessary to achieve, sustain, or restore health." Unquote. I note that this isn't a perfect definition, and epigeneticists, biologists, and chemists would likely pick apart its understanding of what counts as biological intervention. But I think it's intuitive enough to capture most of what I am talking about today. Examples. Captain America's super serum is enhancement. Tony Stark drinking a triple espresso before a mission is not. Emotion reducing pharmaceuticals are an, are an enhancement. Meditation prior to a mission is not. The benefits of enhancement. I'm going to focus here on explicitly ethical benefits of enhancement. Though any enhancement that allows a soldier to advance a just cause in an ethically defensible way is going to be of not way is going to be of not ethical benefit, many are primarily many are primarily strategic, pragmatic, or functional in nature. They're not my focus here. Instead, I'm going to look at two advantages I consider to be primarily ethical decreased combat force size, and enhanced moral decision making. I'll also note some factors that will need to be addressed in order to maximize these advantage. So I'll turn to de de decreased force size. All things being equal, if enhancement is able to improve the capabilities of individual soldiers, then it should reduce the demand for combatants as a whole, that is, we will need to recruit less soldiers and therefore expose less people to the lethal risks posed by war. The decreased force size is not in itself an ethical benefit. 
The benefit lies in the assumed correlation between smaller forces and lower casualty rates. Seen through the lens of just war theory, the oldest and most influential, influential ethical theory regarding the morality of war, this means more wars are likely to satisfy the proportionality criterion. Proportionality stipulates that a war is only just if and when, amongst other things, the anticipated harms of war, including the death and injury to combatants and non-combatants alike, are justified by the overall benefits of waging conflict. Even a just cause cannot be pursued ethically if the harmful outcomes of engaging in conflict would be worse than if no conflict were engaged in at all. This means that the proportionality criteria will sometimes allow us to stand by and watch injustice transpiring rather than taking action, because to intervene would only cause greater harm. One common situation in which this might occur would be when the amount of personnel who would need to be committed to an operation and potentially killed or maimed in the process in order for it to be successful are too great to justify. A historical example of this can be seen towards the end of the Second World War, when an invasion of Japan was seen as unjustifiably based on the anticipated casualties. In these situations, a need to deploy fewer enhanced soldiers who are capable of performing the same operations at a same, ap same operations as a larger unenhanced force, while also achieving the same outcomes, enables us to engage in morally justified operations in which participation would previously have been unethical. It is a matter of historical speculation, but the possibility that a smaller, more effective force might have enabled the military defeat of Japan without requiring the use of atomic bombs against civilians is one I think we are obliged to entertain. Now, maximizing the benefits of a smaller force. As I mentioned above, the proportionality criterion is only one among many considerations that need to be satisfied before a war can be justified. There is concern that reduced casualties and increased in effectiveness will make it easier to resort to military intervention in situations where there are other ethical reasons to abstain from conflict. As a major objection to military engagement, both ethically and amongst the voting public, is the risk of death to a nation's soldiers and to innocent civilians, reducing this possibility may be seen as a force multiplier. Fortunately, there is an easy solution to this challenge. Those involved in, in military decision making <laughs> Those involved in military decision making, including civilian leaders, simply need to remember and reassert their commitment to the other principles of just warfare, just cause, right, inter right intention, last resort, and the like. Enhanced decision making. Enhancement doesn't, evolve, doesn't involve changing combatants' physical abilities. Sorry, excuse me. Enhancement doesn't just involve changing combatants' physical abilities. It can also involve making positive changes to a soldier's neural functioning. For example, the US Air Force provides pilots with modafinil, which improves alertness and enables a person to function for up to 60 hours without sleep. Other drugs have been proposed to reduce aggression and reduce incidents of psychological trauma. To, to the extent these interventions are actually possible, a um, question I'm not qualified to answer, though there is considerable progress that suggests they are, they pose serious ethical questions alongside their promising benefits. Protecting non-combatants. Avoiding the deaths of innocent people as much as possible is perhaps the most sacred principle of military ethics. Enshrined in international law, it is the idea of civilian immunity. This ethical principle requires combatants avoid intentionally targeting non-combatants and also take reasonable risks to, <coughs> to, be, to prevent their being harmed as a side effect. 
The advantage of cognitive enhancement in this regard are twofold. First, having the ability to comprehend complex high pressure situations clearly is likely to lead to decisions that more accurately reflect the reality of the situation. So enhanced soldiers might be able to more quickly distinguish a civilian fleeing an urban combat from a combatant moving to a position of cover. And second, enhancement might be able to reduce incidents of counter moral emotions, which can cloud and corrupt the ethical judgment. For instance, interventions able to mitigate violent aggression. The desire for vengeance or going berserk would have great promise for ethical improvement in warfare. Maximizing the benefit of cognitive enhancements. Before exploring emotional suppressants, it will be necessary to fully understand their role in moral decision making. The assumption underpinning seeing emotional suppressants as an enhancement is that our emotions, at least some of the time, <clears throat> are not informative or significant for decision making. It seems possible that interventions designed to suppress counter moral emotions might not be precise instruments. So that although the desire for, gen for vengeance might be suppressed, so too might the feelings of loyalty and camar camaraderie on that or that um, com or com and camaraderie that define a band of brothers and sisters. A second consideration regards is whether these kinds of cognitive enhances will be voluntary or mandatory for military personnel. The case for voluntary enhancement is weaker in a military context than in other medical areas because military personnel do not enjoy the same rights to patient autonomy as civilians do. However, making enhancements mandatory also creates certain ethical implications. For one, mandatory enhancement might serve as a disincentive for enrolling in the military, depending on broader social attitudes towards human, human enhancement, and therefore compromise the ability for the armed forces to perform a necessary service to the nation. For another, if taking of suppressants is made mandatory and later found to be found to have led to illegal or unethical behavior, the military will face complex legal and ethical challenges in identifying responsibility. Maxwell J. Mailman argues that, quote, the system by which the military holds superior, superiors accountable for unreasonable acts must apply to the unethical or illegal command decisions concerning enhancement, unquote. The implication here would be that those involved either in ordering the mission or in making enhancements mandatory might be held accountable, might be held solely accountable for any problematic consequences arising from them. The position is ethically defensible, but entails serious enough consequences as to warrant close reflection by leadership before implementing any live trials of emotional suppressants. Now I'm going to turn to the risks of enhancement. The first section of this, this, of this discussion concerned maximizing the benefits of enhancement. I'll now turn to a couple of ethical risks implied and suggest some principles we might use to minimize those risks. Challenges to core values. The Australian Army holds the val values of courage, initiative, respect, and teamwork as their cornerstone of all its activities. As well as being praiseworthy in their own right, and the type of values likely to develop ethical combatants being seen to act on those values situates our soldiers in a broader community of warriors. Anecdotally, there are many who testify that soldiers of different nations have more in common with each other than they might with the civilians of their own nation. This is partially due to their shared commitment to particular values. Christian Enmark argues that drone pilots challenge our existing notions of military virtue because they face almost no risk of harm and therefore opportunities to practice courage. 
If the same can be said for enhanced personnel due to their improved physical and cognitive abilities, then there's a possibility that enhanced soldiers might suffer a loss of morale as a product of their disconnection from existing army values. Managing the risk of core values. It seems to me that the most obvious way to work around the potential challenge, which I should note, at least one former senior officer has told me is no challenge at all, is to reframe the conversation around courage as a value so that it is no longer intimately connected to the acceptance of physical risk. Were the, were the army to come to see courage not as the acceptance of possible harm, but more broadly as the willingness to do what's right, despite the difficulties involved, no matter what the difficulties of doing entail, it is possible to reframe the discussion in a way that avoids potential challenges to morale. Treatment of enhanced veterans. Unlike go pills and other medications, some enhancements are likely to be permanent. This creates a substantial area of ethical complexity regarding ownership of enhancements and responsibility for enhanced personnel once they resign their positions and rejoin civilian life. How enhanced veterans will be able to return to civilian life with new abilities that radically separate them from their neighbors is a question with implications ranging from their seemingly inane to matters of national security. For instance, if a soldier is able to run as quickly as an Olympic athlete, should they be permitted to compete in local sports leagues? If not, they are cut off from a major source of community, which is, considered, which is a considerable issue given our growing awareness of existing veterans' struggles with reentry. Can they serve as police officers who presumably will have different legal and ethical permissions around enhancement. Will neurological alterations affect their ability to flourish in relationships? These questions do not present easy answers, but before implementing an enhancement program, Army is obliged to develop management programs around these issues to ensure the ongoing flourishing of those who have been submitted to unusual lasting enhancements. The stakes are even higher when considering who owns an enhanced body. Once a soldier is discharged, they are generally, rest they are generally restored to all the rights they possessed as civilians, including, including total autonomy over their bodies for which a, for a range of reasons is not available to them as enrolled personnel. For enhanced soldiers, should this mean they are permitted to offer themselves as research subjects for universities, private companies, or even foreign governments? How the military manages the interplay between individual rights and classified research in these cases is largely unprecedented. <laughs> Minimizing the risks, minimizing risks of enhanced veterans. There's no easy answer to the challenges posed here. We are still gathering knowledge around how best to service unenhanced veterans, let alone potentially enhanced equivalents. However, in the first instance, it will be important for Army to work closely with the Department of Veteran Affairs to ensure the needs of enhanced veterans are met and any ongoing contact between the military and enhanced veterans is a managed in a way that respects the dignity of those veterans. To conclude, some of the questions around human enhancement are deeply philosophical and existential. Some questions warrant close consideration. However, there is a temptation to pursue these deeper and more heavily contested questions at the expense of addressing more imminent, pragmatic, and applied questions. I don't believe the thoughts I've offered here represent the totality of applied questions around enhancement, but it seems clear to me that the current ethical stock take being undertaken, including identifying some moral principles and governing values, 
needs also to identify what enhancements offers and what the costs might be. In Alice in Wonderland, Alice approaches the Cheshire Cat. Will you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here, she asks. That depends a good deal on where you want to get to, the cat replies. Principles and values will keep us moving on an ethical path, ensuring our exploration of enhancement is free of transgressions. However, it is only by being aware of where we might want enhancement to take us that will have any use for these principles at all. That's the discussion I've tried to con contribute to today. I remember a discussion, and I wasn't there because it was 1940, but the Navy was giving all of its crews in the Western approaches amphetamine sulphate in order to stay awake for a week. So they could go out on patrol, engage in any submarine operations. The trouble was after six months, they were what? Addicted. It was put to them that what would you rather be, addicted or dead? And that was a kind of difficult choice to make. They also found out that the best way to recover from a hangover was amphetamine sulphate. And that's what the captain of HMAS Voyager was using in 1963, uh, the year before the collision, to recover from big nights ashore. So these issues aren't kind of new in that sense. If you've got a comment, a question, uh, or something where you think that Matt's really got it wrong, I invite you now to just wait till the microphone comes. We can hear your voice and record it for the benefit of his chapter. Remember that yuck is not an argument, it's a reaction. And going. Oh. Well, I, I would not say he has anything wrong. I would just suggest that there's a whole, uh, in the US, the Defense Advanced Research, DARPA, I forget, agency, uh, is doing a lot of research in neuroscience. And you can go online now and see that the Chinese uh, cadets you can put a cap on your head and it'll pick up the electrical activity in your mind. They're learning to control drones simply with their mind. And uh, I wrote an article a little while ago about the future of interrogation and it's not torture because now they're developing means where they can put a cap on somebody's head, just ask them questions. The person can stay silent and just by the reaction, they're mapping the brain in such a way that they can determine what it is uh, what the reaction is. It has a lot of implications for criminal law, by the way. And there's even, if you have a cooperative subject, they've even be, been able to, if a person thinks of a block and they've trained it correctly, the machine will come up and show exactly what the person's thinking in, in pictorial form. Not very, not very, uh, you need to tell us, are you objecting to that happening, or you think that's all right? Well, what I'd say... Say in the interrogation I, mode. Yeah. Uh, there are other things in the law of armed conflict that, that might inhibit that, because there's that coercion and so forth. But uh, one of my colleagues is doing a lot of work on this, and uh, her position is we have to start thinking now, and I think that's what, what our speaker says, thinking now about what the implications are. Uh, because when I wrote about this, my, I just left it with the question, the future of interrogation isn't torture, but you still might not like it because of the invasiveness. And my colleague says the last realm of privacy is being invaded now, and that's your private thoughts, because it may be possible in the future, which is not today, but to take someone and put them in a chamber and just by measuring their brain waves know literally what they're thinking. But there's a lot of uh, military implications for that. There are. I, I like the idea. You mightn't like it, but it's better than the alternative. In one sense, yeah. And. Uh, so yeah. just, uh, we were just talking about the, the distant future, but uh, I just wanted to make a quick comment uh, about Dr. Beard's uh, concerns about the, the current, uh, current times, essentially. 
Uh, the comment I'd like to make is that a lot of the enhancement we're talking about here, not just uh, pharmaceutical but particularly surgical, is occurring already. Uh, for example, I have a soldier who uh, the army paid for to uh, do laser surgery on his eyes. And the outcome for that was that he is able to see now at 30-20 vision uh, significantly better, which made him a significantly better shot, uh, which obviously had follow-on implications for um, various things like qualification for uh, with weapon systems. And that was paid for by army, and, and now that soldier's now left the military. Um, was it paid for because it would have that outcome? And, and that's exactly my point. These concerns were not considered in so much as he was, it was paid for so he could do his job better. But it wasn't specifically So hang on, so do his job better or do his job at all? Do his job better. He could have done it with glasses. He could have done it with vision that wasn't 30-20. But the outcome of the surgery was that. And it had follow implications, which made him a better soldier in a different way to what we intended. So it's very important that we consider these, these ethical implications and the unintended consequences of these enhancements before we actually start approving them without a real framework in, in position to make those decisions and make sure that we're not having these unintended consequences. So just help Maggie, did he ask for that to happen or was it put to him that that would be the outcome he might consider it? He, he, it was put to him that the potential was a better increase than he expected but he requested the increase to get back to 20 yeah, but go back a bit. You said that someone else put it to him that he might consider this. Absolutely. So the option has existed for certain professionals within the military for things like um, special forces to get this sort of surgery, to get rid of glasses. This guy particularly needed it because of uh, operating in a special force environment, um, doing repairs to vehicles and, and with the oils and things that might be involved in his eyes. So it was put to him that the option existed for this upgrade. When the option was then presented I like medically, that phrase. when the option was presented medically, the yeah. surgeon then said, the potential is that we'll get you to 2020, there's a potential it'll fail, and there's a potential that it'll be significantly better. Do you want to continue this regardless? He then said yes, it then worked out that he had significant increased vision. And that allowed enable him to do a bunch of other things that he wouldn't have been able to do if we simply been left Okay, I think that would be valuable for Matt to, to hear that, that that was the approach that was taken. One at the back. Okay, so I'm um, being uh, This isn't new. So when, uh, I, I'm a defence psychologist, and uh, even many years ago, we uh, were reading articles and considering ways of limiting people's emotional reactions to trauma. I'm not saying defence was in the business of actually doing it, but it was definitely uh, being looked at, you know, what, what are the ways that we can limit reactions to trauma. And I, I'm going to say that pretty much everything that we put people through in military training is designed to cognitively enhance them with exposure to trauma. So the idea is you don't re react emotionally at the time. And, and, and part of the problem with that is that you'll have potentially a delayed reaction for trauma sometime later down the track. And you may, you may be around other people who don't react appropriately either. So therefore there isn't the stopping of the behaviour. So I think you know anyone that's read the DART reports can see that when you're in an environment where no one's stopping bad things, um, bad things escalate and continue to get worse. And the fact that people are likely to sign up to all of this, one only has to look at the es Essendon Football Club to realise that people will sign up. If you, if you say, well, we can enhance you, we can give you stuff, we can do things, they'll sign up for it without even really often thinking about it. So, so is your point the range of enhancement the extent of the enhancement or the outcomes of the enhancement? Well, I guess my problem is unless you have this conversation with people about what are the potential side effects, what are the potential consequences for you down the track, most the people... Is 22 and really ex Exactly, mature. exactly. Most people will uh, not show any interest in that. They'll go, is this going to make me better? Is this going to make me tougher, stronger, 
more, more prepared, more, more capable in, in the circumstances that are part of my job. Great, sign me up, I'll take it. And, and they're not going to consider well, this is going to make it difficult for you to have relationships. This could potentially affect your um, potency. Uh, you could uh, one day end up impotent. You might have this, you might have that. You might have a whole lot of other side effects um, that you were never advised about. But, you know, so I guess what I'm saying is this paper is probably one of the most important ones you're talking about because we're already in this business. This isn't... This isn't new, as you just said, it isn't new. It's been done to military people for, for generations and generations. Even to the point of giving guys cigarettes when they used to get into aircraft, you know, to, to calm their nerves. Um, we've been giving people drugs for a long time. The, the real question is, are young people aware that they're, they're not aware, so they'll just sign up because they trust you? And then later on in their lives, they find out you actually screwed them over. And they're not so, happy So this is an argument for, for paternalism? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I really think this is one of the reasons I reckon millennials think the way they do. They don't trust. They don't trust former generations. They've had a lot of opportunity to read what people did to young people in the past. And they're saying, you know what? We don't trust you. You've done crap to young people. So you'll do crap to us. So they're very untrusting. And we look at them and go, you know what? You're pretty smart. <laughs> because this has been done to young people in the past. You should be not so trusting. And uh, so I think we have to have more open and honest conversations with our young people about, you know, what are you signing up to? Some will sign up to it, knowing that there are consequences. Others will say, no, thank you. Especially right. if they're football players. Yeah, that's right, especially if they're football players. Anyway, it's just a question. Thank you. We'll, we'll bring the discussion to a close there. For the purposes of the tape and his vicarious encouragement, would you please thank Matt for his paper for us this morning?